I mentioned earlier that Nothing Lasts Forever, the novel on which Die Hard is based, was a sequel to The Detective, which was adapted into a 1968 Frank Sinatra film. Well, when that film was being made, Sinatra apparently liked the script so much, he had it written into his contract that if a sequel ever got made, if, if there was ever anything where his character was would return back to the screen, that he would have the right to first refusal. Meaning that, and you probably already realize where I'm going with this, when Nothing Lasts Forever, when Die Hard went into production, Frank Sinatra had the right to first refusal to star in the film. Yeah. Sinatra was 73 the year production started. Which would have, I mean, that would have fit the novel given Joe Leland in the novel. He's an, he's an older, he's more experienced, he's this, this wizened detective with years of combat under his belt who's just, he's grizzled, he knows what he's doing, he has all this knowledge, he's been an expert, he's playing in all these different things. He's very much the kind of guy that, frankly, you kind of think of Frank Sinatra and he's that guy. But it would have made for an entirely different movie than the one we ended up getting. Well, as you can figure, he inevitably, although by all accounts very gracefully, turned the role down, and eventually Clint Eastwood picked up the rights and considered the main role for himself. He was about 50 at the time, but nothing came of that either. The role then got shopped around a bit. The film got shopped around a bit, including one little bit that seems to have become more myth than anything else, that the film was potentially going to be reworked as a sequel to the 1985 Arnold Schwarzenegger film Commando. Though, that seems to be more of a rumor than anything else. Some people treat it as fact. It seems, from what I can tell, to be a rumor. Although, it sounds pretty cool. It, it would just end up being that thing where, oh, the daughter got kidnapped again. Oh, she's in a high-rise instead of the jungle this time. You know, sequels. Like Kevin McAllister being lost in New York instead of locked at home. Home Alone, man. Good movie. We'll get back to Home Alone. Yeah, we will. <laughs> but yeah, pretty much every single leading man in Hollywood at the time was considered for Die Hard. That included Sylvester Stallone, Burt Reynolds, Al Pacino, Richard Gere, James Caan, and even Harrison Ford. This is about the point where the role changed dramatically, and we lost the original Joe Leland and ended up with John Ford. No, not the director, but the original name for the character that would inevitably be John McClane. Now, a quick note on that. I reached out to one of Die Hard's uh, main writers, Stephen E. D'Souza, to ask him if he remembered where the name John McClane came from, because I could not find any information on the origins of that. And, you know, when I'm coming up with a character's name, it's usually, oh, let me dive into the baby registry. Let me just look in the yellow pages or whatnot. Let me figure out something. Or maybe there's something that I have in my back pocket that I've been saving for a rainy day. I looked for any of that, could not find any information. So, yeah, I reached out to him on Twitter. He sent me an article in response that was in Spanish. Well, I had it translated and looked for the name, and the only little bit of information I could find on it was that he was originally called John Ford. I don't know why. I don't entirely know why they changed it, other than the fact that Ford is a very prolific name, and there are a lot of Fords throughout history, so there's, you know, it, it, the name carries some weight with it, unlike McLean, which is sort of that unknown every man kind of name like that's nobody knows the name McLean or they do now but back then nobody knew the name McLean so whatever we got this John Ford this John McLean and he's no longer this older guy you know they reworked the script they reworked the story they're like well we don't need it to be a sequel to the detective anymore let's try something new so they kind of change it up they say well let's look for a younger guy and they inevitably narrow the pool uh, down to Bruce Willis. Well, they narrow the pool down after everybody else jumps out of the pool. But Bruce Willis, he has, he, he's an unknown. Nobody knows who he is. He is starring in one TV series dramedy kind of thing called Moonlighting. He had two mediocre, at best, movies under his belt. It was a huge payday for Bruce Willis. And obviously a major shift in his career going from this dramedy tv series to this action flick you know it, it was kind of like 
the Chris Pratt of the day. He went from Parks and Rec, this kind of chubby comedian guy, to Gardens of the Galaxy. And suddenly he's like, oh, he's going to be the next Indiana Jones. He's going to be everything. That's what happened with Bruce Willis back then. But again, what makes his casting so brilliant is that he was a nobody. He could be the everyman that is John McClane. This flawed New York street cop that gets thrown into this this impossible, dire situation, and one that he, he barely makes it out of with his life. You know, he learns himself a few life lessons along the way, so it all kind of equals out. Compare that to Joe Leland, who's this, you know, he's, he's experienced. He even knows the bad guy. He, he just, he recognizes him by his voice in the book. You know, and he's as jaded as a jade scorpion. And what's more, his character doesn't grow. And he is absolutely, utterly destroyed by the plot of the book. Hey, there's even a chance he doesn't even make it out of the book. It, it kinda, you kinda get the sense that he dies at the end of the book. Whether or not that is factual or not, I don't know, but they, Thorpe never wrote a sequel to it, so it's possible. But Bruce Willis's John McClane, he's, he's more complex. You know, he, he's, he's more, he's more complicated more faulty, more rebellious even. And he gets scared. He he cries. He feels like a human. He, he It's like if I got put in that situation, at least that's what I hope I would be like in that kind of situation. I'm not a New York street cop, so I'd probably just be, you know, cowering in the corner like, uh, like Hans does at the end. And the writers did even more for his character than just kind of make him into a human, make him somebody that everyone can sort of relate to in a way. What they did was they married the external conflict happening around him, this this terrorist robbery thing happening in Nakatomi Plaza with his character's inner turmoil. The external plot directly impacts his internal conflict and vice versa. And both are solved through the same series of events. We both, we, both of these things get a satisfying conclusion by the end of the film. That is, you, you know, the internal conflict is that he and his wife, Holly, are on the rope. Something, again, that we learned through Argyle. Good old Argyle. You know, you know, before we dive into that, let's talk Holly for a moment. Not just because she's so integral to the movie, but because she's so different than what we get in the book. Don't get me wrong, the basis is still there, that commitment to the job, that's a very driving point of her character. But in Nothing Lasts Forever, there is nothing redeemable about her character. You know, I was saying that earlier, that there's really nothing redeemable about any of the characters, and Holly's character, she's not Holly in there, uh, she is Miss Gennaro, she is Joe Leland's daughter in the book, not his estranged wife. But, you know, in, in the film, we see Ellis snort cocaine, right? see kind of he's interrupting that in the film it's very obvious they're all snorting the cocaine that she's sleeping with Alice uh that she's just doing whatever she can to climb that corporate ladder and in the end she ends up she ends up falling out the window with the bad guy she dies so she's she's never redeemed like there she doesn't have a story arc she's not really a character she's a plot device with Holly, we get the exact opposite. Not only do we get that fantastic, metaphorical, kind of transformative scene where her watch is unclassed at the end. You might think I'm reaching there, but I assure you that is totally metaphorical. I don't care what anybody says. You argue all you want in the comments. Totally metaphorical. Transformative. But we also get to see Holly as a strong, no-nonsense, independent woman. And at a time, in an era that is only at best hiding the fact that everything is sexist in the world, especially within Hollywood, especially within corporate, high-end corporate transactions like we cover in this, that is saying a lot that she is up there holding her own against all of the male characters. And she's not ever villainized for wanting a career. She's even praised as being a good mother. She's very much presented as being a good, welcoming, 
helpful mother. Heck, she even stands up to Hans a few times. And what's so perfect about Holly, at, at least in Die Hard, we're, we're not going to talk the sequels right now because the sequels are a completely different beast. But at least in Die Hard, Holly is written not just as an equal to John McClane, but perhaps in many ways better than John McClane. After all, don't forget, John is the one who chose to stay behind in New York while Holly pursued her career. He's the one that said, oh, I've got paperwork on my desk. I can't just up and leave while his family flew across the world. Yeah, so who's the better parent here? So, back to McLean. While getting together with Holly to celebrate Christmas with her and the kids and uh, trying to play nice after the six months or so separation, he gets thrown to this. He gets just, just pushed into this situation. He gets thrown to the wolves, basically, in this just horrible situation. And it's only after he has conquered his internal conflict, after he's accepted Holly's choice to find a career to to explore her career to climb that corporate ladder and do what she thinks is best for her and her family it's only after he accepts that and he grows as a character that he is able to conquer the external conflict by realizing what it is that needs to be done and getting this kind of clarity of mind so he can finally see what is going on it's the bathroom scene I'm talking about here, in case you didn't realize. Where things look super doom and gloom, and McLean's in there pulling glass out of his feet, and he's just hit rock bottom, and he's just tearing up, and he's just drenched in blood. And he gives this beautiful monologue through the walkie-talkie. I want you to find my wife, he says to, you know, our buddy cop there, our, our pal, our, our Powell, Al... What, why does his name sound so familiar? I don't get it. I want you to tell her something. Tell her it took me a while to figure out what a jerk I've been. But that when things started to pan out for her, I should have been more supportive. And I just should have been behind her more. Tell her that she is the best thing that ever happened to a bum like me. She's heard me say I love you a thousand times. She's never heard me say I'm sorry. To which Powell responds, You can tell her yourself. Just watch her ass and you'll make it. And we get... And this part, this is the clinch. This is the important part. I hope so. But that's up to the guy upstairs. Upstairs. Hans, you bastard. What were you doing? See, it's all through this doubt, this fear, this reconciliation that McLean is able to, to move forward, to conquer, to think clearly. So if it hadn't been for that external conflict, he wouldn't have found the solution to his internal conflict. And if he didn't find the solution to his internal conflict, he wouldn't have had the peace of mind to figure out the external conflict. Every plot intersects. Every bit of the story is organically woven together. McLean's character is organically woven into the plot. The plot and him are like at this tug of war for characterization. It's something that you rarely see in a movie, and it's right here in Die Hard. It's all woven together in this complex narrative that really, truly never, ever seems that complex, which is how the writers, it, it, the writers are so brilliant that they are able to make something so complicated, so simple. 